at the heart of Christianity lies something shameful. I've mentioned before how parents in my home city of Birmingham objected to a large crucifix outside a church. It scares the children, they said. The Roman Catholic counter-reformation of the 16th and 17th centuries went in for some very graphic depictions of the crucifixion, too gaudy, perhaps, for our contemporary sensibilities. But perhaps we need to be reminded that Jesus' crucifixion was not a nice or tasteful event. It was shameful and bloody. Death by crucifixion was a common occurrence. Jesus' crucifixion was by no means unique in that respect. But it was reserved for those considered the lowest of the low. No Roman citizen could be crucified, at least not without the express permission of the emperor. For a Jew to be hung on a tree was to be cursed by God. If a man is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, be sure to bury him that same day, because anyone who is hung on a tree is God's curse. Deuteronomy chapter 21 verses 22 and 23. Well, please turn to our passage. Matthew 27, beginning at verse 27. You'll find it on page 965 of the Church Bibles. In verse 27 it says that the whole company of soldiers gathered around Jesus. The word the NIV translates as a company was probably a cohort about 500 men, 500 burly Roman soldiers, far from home, after some sport at another's expense. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. That was probably one of their outer cloaks, mockingly meant to symbolize royalty. They twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. We can be led astray by somewhat dainty depictions of the crown of thorns. The thorns would likely have been long and sharp, an instrument of torture. And you can imagine what setting it on his head would have involved at the hands of a Roman soldier. It would have been rammed home. They put a staff in his right hand, a wooden pole meant to represent a royal scepter, uh, what our queen was given at her coronation. Except hers was the real thing in gold and bejeweled. Then they likely would have lined up all 500 of them, starting with the most junior and taken their turn to mock Jesus. Hail, King of the Jews, each one spitting in his face, then using the staff to ram the thorns in further. There was nothing nice about that scene. It was akin to the barbaric killings that we know go on in parts of the world today. A body horrifically mutilated. It was shameful and bloody. Jesus is taken out to be crucified at Golgotha. As he hangs there, the mockery continues at verses 39 to 44. 
this, those who passed by. You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. There's the Jewish chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders. He saved others, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. And in the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. What do we make of this? What is our reaction? It's likely that we'll be repulsed by it. The people of that time, Jews and Romans alike, were barbaric. How could they do that? Yet we know that gruesome killings do go on even now. Whether it's at the hand of ISIS, or in a government torture chamber, or closer to home, we know that horrific killings do occur. If Scandinavian film noir is to be believed, places like Malmo are awash with gruesome murders. It's part of the repeated brutality of human being to human being. Some might say, that Jesus got what he deserved. Certainly, that would have been the case at the time. An Orthodox Jew would have said so. Some might say so today. Jesus went about claiming to be the king of the Jews, but when he was no such thing. He knew what the penalty was. He was given the opportunity to recant. Pilate, the Roman governor, asked him, are you the king of the Jews? To which Jesus' response was, Yes, it is as you say. Matthew 27, 11. Matthew was an eyewitness of these events. Yet he's selective in the details he chooses to give. And he's selective in a way that his primarily Jewish audience would have understood. He selects details that highlight the irony of what was going on. Any Jew hearing or reading Matthew's account would have his ears constantly pricked. What's going on is in accordance with what the Old Testament particularly Psalms 22 and 69, said would happen to God's king. The irony is, the soldiers who mock Jesus call it right. He is king of the Jews. Verse 37, above his head, they place the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The irony is, the sign proclaimed it right. When passers-by deride him, the basis of their derision is, in fact, that which is true about Jesus. The key to Jesus' suffering and dying is that it is the death with which God is pleased. A lot of people nowadays would say of Jesus' death that it was a noble thing, perhaps even something really wonderful. And Matthew would agree. That's part of what he's trying to get across. But if God's king came and died, and it's just a noble act, what does it achieve? Well, we might say 
but it shows that God understands suffering. And that's a big part of our current culture. Empathy. A friend of mine said that you only had to sneeze at his theological college and you had half a dozen people offering tissues, feeling his pain. But such empathy on God's part doesn't, to my mind, actually do anything. Nothing is achieved by it. To use a 17th century expression, fine words butter no parsnips. Let me try and illustrate what I'm trying to get to. A man is drowning. Someone jumps in beside him. By doing so, he also experiences what it's like to drown, and they both die. How much comfort to the first man was the second man's actions? Or, we have a homeless problem in Vancouver. Carl could take up his sleeping bag and sleep rough. I'd then know what it feels like firsthand. But how would that, in itself, help others on the street? It's a banal platitude to say, I understand, I empathize, but to do nothing about it. But there's additional irony in what Matthew tells us. Not only is Jesus' death the shameful, suffering death of God's real king, it's in the sacrificial nature of that death that something is actually achieved. Each time Jesus is taunted, his death achieves the very thing his mockers are taunting him about. Verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Jesus had said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. To which the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days. John, in his account, then explains. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. John 2, verses 19 to 21. The temple was the Jewish place of sacrifice in atonement for sin. Through Jesus' sacrificial death on our behalf, he was carrying upon himself the weight of God's judgment. There was from that time, no further need of sacrifices for sin. Jesus had paid the price in full. The temple was from that time redundant. Verse 42. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. The irony is that Jesus was carrying God's judgment through his death on the cross on our behalf. He was doing so precisely so that he would be able to offer salvation to others, to you and to me. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. The irony is 
But it's precisely because Jesus was willing to die on the cross on our behalf that billions of Christians find reason to follow and believe in him. As Jesus is lifted up on the cross, we see him carrying God's judgment upon himself on our behalf. The guiltless one dying for the sake of the guilty. Us. You and me. The reason why God is pleased with Jesus is because he went willingly to death on our behalf in obedience to his Father. Three possible responses to Jesus' death. Do we just see the facts of suffering and perhaps even think, tragic as it was, he had it coming to him because he wasn't what he said he was? Essentially, uh, Jesus was bad. He made false claims and was punished for them, there being no other significance. Or perhaps we see Jesus' death in terms of empathy. It was a noble death, inspirational even, but it didn't achieve anything beyond that. If that's where you're at with Jesus' death, I'd respectfully suggest that you need to think again. For that wasn't Matthew's purpose in writing what he did. He wants us to grasp a deeper meaning. That Jesus was a sacrificial death on our behalf. One that made the temple redundant, having paid the price for our sin in full. One that offers the promise of salvation, eternal life with God to all who accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Saviour, knowing that he died in our place. A death with which God is deeply pleased. That's really what's going on on the cross.